but thank you all for coming. I do appreciate it. Thank you for, to, to Dennis and Chandra from the museum for staging this series of lunchtime talks. Thank you to Karen from the archives. Oh. 15 seconds in, I've got a round of applause. Yay. <laughs> Thanks to Karen from the archives for giving me a lot of encouragement and access to all the records that are stored here in the Penticton archives. And a general thank you to the Penticton Herald just for being there. It has been a fabulous source of information going back 100 years or so. Um, I, most days I take a morning walk and one of my favorite routes is to go past the Cenotaph in Veterans Memorial Park. And I've wandered through that little park maybe a maybe hundred times. And I always stop for a few moments and say hello to the names listed there. And I read the inscriptions. Uh, among them is one you find on war memorials uh, the world over. At the, at the bottom there, their name liveth forevermore. One day earlier this year, I was walking through and I saw that and I thought, yeah, the names live forever, forevermore, but who were they? And by no means short of things to keep me occupied during the average day, I decided to find out. And it's been a fascinating journey. Uh, it's by no means finished. In fact, I've only barely started this, this project. As Chandra just said, I've always had a great interest in history. Uh, one of my hobbies is genealogy, looking up family trees and stuff. And I'm also a professional accountant. Hurrah! <laughs> The first two of those, I imagine you could see as being relevant to a project like this, history and genealogy. But what on earth has being an accountant got to do with this sort of project? Well, I always say that the job of the accountant is creating order out of chaos. <laughs> Accountants do it with numbers. Historians do it with historical facts and little snippets of information. But the process is pretty much the same, and it's one that I enjoy very much. My talk today will be in two parts. The first is a history of the Cenotaph itself. And then I will share with you what I've been able to find out about two of the names listed on the Cenotaph. So the Cenotaph, here it is looking solid, beautiful, and permanent. Uh, but I wonder how many of you know that it started its life somewhere completely different, not where it is today. On the 12th of December 1918, with the echoes of the guns still sounding in the battlefields of France, the Penticton Herald reported that a committee had been appointed to assess suggestions for a memorial to those who lost their lives in the Great War. Will it be a park? Will it be a building? Or something else? The committee was to report back to the council, and then the recommendations would be laid before the public. One idea was to turn the area between the Naimo and Westminster and Martin and Winnipeg into a park. And that's, you see, outlined in red, that's the area we're talking about. That would have made a public space bigger than any of the parks we currently have in the north end of the city. Another idea was to build a library on a municipal property at the corner of Main Street and Fairview Road, Fairview Avenue. Discussion at this meeting was lively and energetic, said the newspaper. The proposer of the park idea said that such a memorial would prove a lesson to future generations and promote good citizenship. That's what parks are all about. As for the Main Street and Fairview proposal, the theme, uh, there was a suggestion that it include a fountain, a monument, and a bandstand. And the public meeting was called for Friday, 10th of January, 1919. On the eve of this meeting, the library idea had expanded to a two-story building that would include not only the library, but also a gymnasium, a reading room, an assembly hall, and a museum. Does that sound in any way familiar? And this is 1919 we're talking about. Attendance at that meeting was rather thin. So another public meeting was called for three weeks later in the council chamber. Every citizen was urgently requested to attend, said the insert in the Penticton Herald. Although this meeting was well attended, the, the Reeve, now that's a wonderful medieval sounding name, the Reeve, it means the mayor, but it, it's the name from which we get today's sheriff, being the Shire Reeve back in the medieval England. The Reeve 
reported that responses to a questionnaire that had been sent out was disappointing. 750 forms were sent out to citizens seeking their views on what the memorial should be. Only 130 were returned, and the responses were very mixed. In exasperation, the Reeve announced that the whole project should be shelved for the while. Ain't that just typical? Too difficult, let's move it to somewhere else. <laughs> Nevertheless, discussions continued behind closed doors with a suggestion emerging that a more modest memorial be erected on a triangular lot at the corner of Main Street and Westminster Avenue. And there you see the triangular lot, and you can also see it's much more modest than the original park idea. So that's where they were up to, but then still nothing happened. In 1920, the new council announced yet another public meeting in April. And despite attendance being once again disappointing, only 13 people turned up. And we got many more than 13 here, so imagine how small that meeting was. The decision was made that the memorial would take the form of a 27-foot obelisk standing on a 10-foot pedestal, and that would be standing on a 16-foot square base to be erected in that lot at the junction of Main and Westminster. And it was described as the most important corner in town. The cost, estimated at $4,500, would be borne partly by the municipal council and partly by public subscription. Gunmetal tablets would be inscribed with the names of the fallen and a few well-chosen biblical references. There would also be a list of all the Canadian and Imperial regiments that had Penticton people serving in them. Also inscribed would be the words dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. This is a Latin phrase from the Roman poet Horace, made much more famous by the English poet Wilfred Owen, who himself served in the First World War. The translation is, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Of course, it's only possible for somebody who has not made that ultimate sacrifice to write such a thing. <laughs> which is why Owen, in his own poem, referred to it as the old lie. But we'll come back to it later. The form and content of the memorial had now been agreed, but the location was still a matter of some debate. In the face of enormous public apathy, the committee decided to proceed on its own initiative. And on May the 20th, May the 6th, 1920, it was announced that the final site for the obelisk was now to be this triangular plot owned by the city opposite the high school. This location was considered to be less obstructive than the downtown proposal, and we certainly don't want a war memorial at that time to be obstructive of anybody, and would prove an inspiration to generations of school children who would be just attending school just over the road. The cost was now estimated at between four and a half and five thousand dollars, of which the city agreed to put in one thousand. Money started to come in, but very slowly. The committee instituted house-to-house -house fundraising, knocking on doors, asking for money. But by mid-June, only half the required amount had been subscribed. Nevertheless, on 11th November 1920, Armistice Day, the new monument was unveiled. The final bill rendered by the manufacturer in Vancouver amounted to $4,565 plus 2% sales tax, $91.30. But there was still a shortfall of between two and $300, which the uh, city paid for. But the Penticton War Memorial was now finally a reality. And every armistice day thereafter doing the job for which it had been created. It also hosted a few other commemorations, such as the anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which is a key element in the, of Canada's contribution to the fighting in the First World War. Touchingly, in 1923, a bride placed her wedding bouquet there, stopping the car in which she and her husband were heading off to their honeymoon. In 1924, an editorial in the Penticton Herald referred to a letter received from a war veteran of distinguished service. The writer felt that war memorial was a way of remembering the war, and he said it was not the war that should be remembered, but those who gave their lives in it. The word cenotaph comes from the Greek and means empty tomb, 
And in the context of war memorials, it's taken to mean a monument to someone buried in another place, which unfortunately was the case for all these names. The writer suggested, therefore, that this title should be more appropriate and more in keeping with the honor and dignity of those whose memory it is to perpetuate. He had a point, because later in the year, the Herald announced tributes laid on cenotaph on Armistice Day. So ever since then, it has been a cenotaph, not a war memorial. Less known than the monument... Yep, nope. Yeah. Less known than the monument itself was a gun that had been placed there, perhaps as a defiant symbol. This German artillery piece, captured by Canadian soldiers, had fallen into disrepair. Its metal parts were rusting, and the wooden mount was rotting away. A government official in faraway Ottawa, now he obviously didn't walk past this, he must have been tipped off by somebody, but this official wrote to the city in 1936, requesting immediate action to repair the damage. But the unfortunate weapon was to suffer an even worse fate. In 1942, with the Second World War very much underway, without fanfare or ceremony, the Herald reported, the old war trophy was taken off to the salvage freight shed as part of Penticton's contribution to the national campaign for salvaging scrap metal. So that was the end of the German artillery piece. But interestingly, a second trophy came to a similarly useful end. There was a German trench mortar which was stood in the Penticton Canadian Legion Hall. Uh, and this was dismantled with a sledgehammer at the hands of Reginald Atkinson, president of the Legion branch, and of whom a little bit more later. As a noted collector of such things, it may well have been Atkinson who tipped off the official in Ottawa about the, the rotting uh, cannon that had been standing next to the cenotaph. Tragically, even before the new conflict was finished, attention was turning to how best to honor those who had already died and those who would inevitably do so uh, before peace reigned once more. By 1944, a list of 58 names had been collated and published in the Herald under the headline, Their Name Liveth Forevermore. Among the names was that of Dennis Beams, an Air Force pilot who lost his life in February 1944. One can only imagine what was going through the mind of his father, the Reverend W.S. Beams, the Legion's chaplain, when he led the memorial service later that year. As had happened a generation earlier, a number of suggestions were put forward as to how best to honor those who died in the second conflict. In 1947, it was agreed to place a bronze plaque on the cenotaph and that the Legion obtain an accurate list of names. After much canvassing in the press, a final list of 78 names was published. Bronze plaques were made and installed in time for that year's Remembrance Day commemoration. The Reverend Beams once again officiated, but this time he was comforted by the fact that his surviving son, Sub-Lieutenant H.W. Beams, had the honor of sounding the last post. With the increased prominence and use of the monument as a result of the second global conflict, in 1948, the Legion instituted, in, initiated a plan to move it to a new location. You might recognize where that is, to the north of the new provincial building on Main Street, now the courthouse. Permission for the move was quickly obtained from the provincial authorities, but the question then arose, how was it to be done? Contractors were asked to bid for the job, but the general response was it was too difficult. We've never moved a cenotaph before, they said. Uh, well, yes, surprisingly, um, but without knowledge of how it was constructed, they considered that there would be too many risks. Eventually, a contractor was found and willing to do the job for $1,000 with a guarantee that it be finished by the all-important date of 11th November. As city crews started work on the concrete base, Mr. F. O. McNeil, proprietor of Penticton Monumental Works, felt the pressure rising. Could it be moved in sections? Or would the whole thing have to be lifted as one? It was estimated to weigh about five tons. Would it fall apart? The only way to find out was to try. Fortunately, it was discovered 
that this monument could be separated into pieces, albeit of one or two tons each. No crane was available, so instead Mr. McNeil used a large shovel. And this thing that looks rather like a dinosaur is a shovel. Imagine clearing the snow from your yard with one of those. Wouldn't it be fun? <laughs> The move and reassembly was completed in time for the 1948 Armistice Day commemoration, with the Reverend W.S. Beams once again officiating. Today, the Penticton Cenotaph continues to serve its purpose as a memorial to brave men and women who have given their lives in an increasing number of international conflicts to which Canadians continue to lend their support. Here it is in 1960. Apart from the shape of the plot of land on which it used to sit, Almost nothing remains of the old cenotaph. However, this old image gives a clue. The surrounding wall is made up of large round stones, similar to those that still surround the high school on the other side of Main Street. The old school building is, is the one uh, you see behind. And um, where it now says Penticton City Centre, at either end of that low wall, there is a nod to the old wall with these large round stones. So it's the only reminder there is of what used to be there. I would now like to move on to the second part of my talk and share with you the stories of two of the names that feature on the Cenotaph. There are in total 135 names and I intend <laughs> I intend to research them all, <laughs> but so far I have completed two, <laughs> so I'm busy for a long time, Janet. <laughs> I chose to start with the Second World War, and being an accountant, I started with the first two. And these are Robert Archer and Roy Atkinson. As you can see, the announcement of their deaths appeared in the same newspaper report in the Penticton Herald. Firstly, some words about how I conducted my research. Being a genealogist, I went straight to Ancestry.ca, where I found an enormous amount of information, uh, including full service files for the people I was interested in, 60 or more pages for each person, uh, containing information on enlisting, training, posting overseas, medical issues. I've even got the dental records of one of these guys and the inevitable death notices. For those local men who joined the Air Force, entire squadron diaries are available online at no charge from the National Archives in London. And these diaries uh, record the crews, the names of the crews that flew, the times they took off, where they went, and which, one of them, which ones of them came back. Good old Mr. Google also contributed uh, the occasional gem, but perhaps the most useful was the Penticton Herald online and keyword searchable thanks to Karen at the archives. When looking through old copies of the Herald, time and again I was struck by what a close community Penticton was in the 1930s and 40s. I kept seeing the same names cropping up, marrying each other, entertaining each other, spending holidays with each other, playing each other at sports. And I came across gems such as this one. Mr. Atkinson, manager of the union, is enjoying a visit this week from his mother, who came down from Vernon on Tuesday evening's boat. Oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> How did that get into the paper? Did Mr. Atkinson write himself? Or was it a nosy neighbor? Oh, look, oh, I think that's his mother. Yes, it's his mother. She was here last year. She must have come down from, uh, yeah, she'll have come down on the, on the uh, evening boat last night from Vernon. I'll write to the paper and tell them. <laughs> But thank God they did, however it got there, because it's very useful stuff. <laughs> Robert William Bob Archer was born on 1st October 1915 in Vancouver. His father, William Archer, was in the real, est real estate business. In 1919, the family moved to Penticton, where in September, William started business as a retailer of menswear in a shop on Main Street, trading as archers. The 1921 census recorded the family as living in a six-room house at 51 Main Street, 
William's business seems to have been unsuccessful as the family soon returned to Vancouver and William went back to real estate. However, another real retail opportunity arose in Penticton when, in 1932, William bought the stock of an existing business and opened a new shop, this time trading as Archer's menswear. Robert started working for his father as a salesman and later manager. His parents became active members of the community. William was the treasurer of the Penticton Elks Lodge, and his wife, Robert's mother, Sarah, was a keen member of the ladies' bowling club. Unfortunately, William's health began to suffer, and on 10th April 1939, he died of a stroke. He's buried at the Lakeview Cemetery, Penticton. Following the death of his father, Robert ran the family clothing business for a while before selling out and joining the menswear department of Pye and Hilliard. And this is another example of how small the Penticton, or how close the Penticton community seemed to be in those days. The partners of this business were F.G. Pye and W. Brock Hilliard, whose son, Donald, a trooper with Fort Gary Horse, is also inscribed on the cenotaph. He was killed on 6 June 1944 in the D-Day landings. With his new employer, Robert's experience with his father's shop and his higher diploma in accountancy gained from LaSalle College in Vancouver enabled him to work both as salesman and as a bookkeeper. On 8 February 1940, it was announced that Robert had become engaged to Penticton girl Dorma Noel McQuiston. They married on 21st March. Dorma's brother, Bruce, a sergeant with the 9th Armoured Regiment of the BC Dragoons was killed in Italy in December 1944, and his name, as you can see, is also on the cenotaph. Robert felt he had to look after his recently widowed mother, and so he did not join one of the services when war broke out in 1939. Then, becoming a newly, ma newly married man made this even more difficult for him. However, in October 1941, he joined the 9th Armoured Regiment of the BC Dragoons, most likely at the same time as his brother-in-law, Bruce. Initially a reserve army to provide for home defence, in November 1941, the Dragoons were deployed for active service in Europe. But when Robert joined, he was still based in Penticton. On 9th July 1942, Robert and Dorma announced the arrival of a daughter, Leslie Evelyn. However, Robert had already been exploring the possibility of joining the Royal Canadian Air Force. The Air Force had been holding many recruitment talks in the Okanagan, and his interest must have been sparked by the glamour and excitement of flying. In April 1942, even before the birth of his daughter, he attended an Air Force medical board in Vancouver. And he was recorded as being five foot nine and a half inches tall, weighing 146 pounds. He smoked 10 cigarettes a day, took the occasional drink, which reminds me, excuse me, I've got some vodka around here, which I'll just, uh, I know it looks like Gatorade, but. Uh, what was I talking about? <clears throat> yes, he took the occasional drink, as for sickness, he confessed to having been car sick once, nine years previously. So that's a full medical record of him. The reporting medical officer also recorded, candidate is keen and anxious to get into air crew, but a squint in left eye rules him out as a pilot. An intelligent chap, due to age and slight tenseness, would think he would be better as a navigator. At a more general interview in June, it was recorded that Robert was doubtful as a candidate for commission, meaning that he wasn't considered to be officer material, and that his medical assessment was not sufficiently good for pilot. On the other hand, he had good physique, a pleasant temperament, and good attitude. It concluded that he was a responsible type and should prove a good prospect. So it was with this somewhat mixed assessment that Robert set off again for Vancouver on the 15th of August 1942 to attend a 12-week pre-enlistment course for the RCAF. He was one of seven, including two women, from Penticton who enlisted at that time for the Air Force. One of these was William Fraser Sutherland, 
whose name also features on the cenotaph. By then, the war was in full swing and air crew were desperately needed. But there was much training to be undergone before Robert could go and play his part. Canada, being a long way from the front line, provided many training facilities for Allied airmen. So it was natural, therefore, that Robert should conduct his initial training in this country. Having completed his course on 2nd November 1942, he was transferred from Vancouver to No. 3 Manning Depot in Edmonton. This was where military life really started. By the end of the war, over 4,000 Air Force recruits had passed through this depot, each one having been tested, lectured, and taught how to march with many hours spent on the parade ground. It was here that Robert would have been issued with uh, his uniform, boots, socks, and everything else that an airman needed, apart from his own aircraft, of course. He would have learned how to iron his clothes, spit polish his boots, polish his buttons, shine floors, and clean toilets. And for this privilege, he was paid $1.30 a day. Robert's next move was on 23rd January 1943 to number seven initial training school in Saskatoon. This establishment's purpose was to assess the trade for which Air Force recruits would be most suitable. <coughs> yep, Robert did well, coming sixth out of 116 in his class. The official report notes that he was a good type airman, keen for air crew and action. And reflecting his early medical report, it went on to say he cannot be a pilot and should make a good navigator. On 4th April 1943, leading aircraftman Archer, service number J35033, arrived home in Penticton for two weeks furlough with his family before being posted to number five Air Observer School in Winnipeg. This, the first stage of his training as a navigator, commenced on 19th April. By the completion of this course on 3rd September, Robert had flown 103 hours, 20 minutes as observer navigator in Avro Anson aircraft, like this one. In his report, he was described as a conscientious navigator who had done good work in the air and on the ground. And based on this performance so far, Robert was promoted to pilot officer, thereby receiving the commission for which he was not long previously been considered unsuitable. He was also considered to be sufficiently trained as an air navigator for him to be sent over to England to start putting his experience into practice. He was allowed to travel to Penticton for two weeks pre-embarkation leave from 4th to 17th September 43, and this was to be the last time he would see his wife and little daughter. After this brief period at home, Robert reported to Halifax, Nova Scotia on 18 September 43 to await shipment overseas. He eventually embarked at Boston on 9th October, arriving in England eight days later. The clearing house for incoming Canadian airmen at that time was number three personnel reception center in Bournemouth, a seaside town on the south coast of England. And this is where Robert found himself on the 18th of October. He, and hundreds like him, would have been accommodated in requisitioned hotels and luxury flats, of which there were a great many in Bournemouth. It had been over a year since he'd volunteered to join the Air Force, but it was still going to be another nine months before he was to see any action. Meanwhile, he could enjoy the sea air and whatever other excitement and attractions wartime Bournemouth had to offer. By this stage in the war, the Royal Air Force in Britain had developed a strict, streamlined, and rapid routine for training its flight crews. And Robert soon found himself bundled along in that system. On 21st December 1943, he was transferred to an advanced flying unit where he underwent further navigational training, again in Avro Anson aircraft. He completed this course on the 15th February 1944, and was assessed as a steady, satisfactory navigator both in the air and on the ground. Very consistent, schoolwork very good for all subjects. On the strength of this performance, on 3rd March, Robert was promoted once more, this time to flying officer, one grade above pilot officer. And he was now ready for the next step. This was to number 83 operational training unit. The purpose of the OTU was to train night bomber crews flying twin-engined Vickers Wellingtons like this one. 
The Wellington was a mid-1930s design that was already being phased out of active service in favor of larger aircraft, but it was bigger than any that Robert had flown in so far. And he flew a total of 130 hours in Wellingtons, including 86 at night, and he attended 31 hours of lectures. He was rated a good average navigator and keen. It was also at the OTU that airmen arriving for a particular course melded together as crews that would eventually fly together. This was done by natural selection, meaning men formed their own teams centered around the pilot with people they felt they could get on with. It wasn't forced, it was all coming together naturally. And this was very important, considering the purpose for which they were training so hard. In Robert's case, five of the seven-man crew were British, but the pilot, pilot officer P.M. Roche, was a fellow Canadian, which is probably why Robert gravitated towards that particular uh, crew. So it was with his newly formed crew that Robert was posted on 19th May 1944 to number one Lancaster Finishing School to be introduced to the type of aircraft they were going to fly in action. And that's this beauty, the four-engined Avro Lancaster, the most successful and famous of the Allied bombers in the Second World War. This establishment, the finishing school, was based at RAF Hemswell in Lincolnshire. Being relatively flat and underpopulated, and within striking distance of Germany, Lincolnshire was home to more than 50 RAF stations during the war. Robert and his crew now received intensive training for the first time on the actual aircraft that they were to fly into combat. Seven weeks were all they were given before they were being posted to their first squadron, operational squadron, number 550 squadron at RAF North Killingholm, 30 kilometers away on the Lincolnshire coast. And here you can see North Killingholm, this is the um, diary of this Air Force uh, station. And from number one LFS, Lancaster Finishing School on 8th of July, PM Roche and his crew, including RW Archer as navigator. So he's recorded in their records as arriving on the 8th of July. Robert's first operation, now I don't expect you for a moment to read this, I'm showing it only to overawe you with the amount of detail that you can get in these records that are kept at the archives in London. Robert's first operation, which is described here, and the operation is the term, a sort of euphemistic term for a bombing raid on enemy territory, was on the night of 19th July, 1944, and that's the record for this particular operation, 19th July. The target being a large synthetic oil plant in the Ruhr industrial area of Germany. Raids such as this one demanded hugely complex logistics, often comprising up to 1,000 aircraft, the movements of each one carefully coordinated and controlled, and requiring a great deal of skill from the navigators. Of the 16 550 Squadron Lancasters that took part, all but one returned safely. He flew operations on the 20th, 23rd, and 24th of July. After a few days' break from bombing activities, in the late evening of Friday, 28th July, Robert and his crew took off for their fifth operation, a return to Stuttgart. 16 of the 18 squadron aircraft involved returned safely. Roberts was not one of them. Initially reported as missing, it was subs subsequently confirmed that Robert had died on the 29th of July, 1944. His aircraft had crashed near the town of Blémont in German-occupied northeast France on his way back to England. Robert had been in the Air Force for nearly two years and had been with his squadron exactly three weeks. All seven crew members were killed. The mayor of Blémont asked permission from the Germans to collect the bodies from the crash site for, for proper burial in the town cemetery. This was granted. The seven graves are still there, carefully tended, with headstones that record each of the killed airmen that for Robert leaves, till we meet again, dear Bob. Roy Vickers Atkinson was born in Penticton on 10th October 1922. A few days after his 20th birthday, he presented himself to the recruiting office in Vernon, where he underwent the usual medical examination. 
This being successful, on 9th November 1942, he returned to Vernon and was sworn in as a private in the Canadian Army. In this, he was following in his father's footsteps. And I'm going to diverge a little bit now and tell you something about his father, because uh, his father is quite um, important to, to the room that we're sitting in right now. Reginald Noel Atkinson originated from Vancouver, where he was born in 1897. By the time he was 13, the family had moved to Penticton. He was the eldest of three brothers. Reginald's father, had been working as a railway postal clerk and came to Penticton as the town's postmaster. He also planted an orchard in his property and operated a small fruit packing business. And it was probably for this reason that Reginald described himself as a fruit grower when he volunteered for active service on 17th of January 1916. He had already been a member of the 102nd Rocky Mountain Rangers for more than a year. And here he is with H Company of the Rocky Mountain Rangers in front of the Incola Hotel in October 1914. And he is that one. This body, headquartered in Kamloops, had been placed on active service in British Columbia in August 1914, less than two weeks after the outbreak of the First World War. Although it contributed to Canada's fighting units in Europe, the main function during Reginald's time was staffing internment camps and guarding bridges in the interior of BC. As soon as he was old enough, Reginald went to Kamloops to join the regular army. His attestation paper shows that he was placed in the 172nd Battalion Canadian Expeditionary Force. This had become a well-trodden route for Rangers men to follow. The commander of the battalion was Colonel John Vickers. The colonel's son, Desmond, was also in the battalion and was of similar age to Reginald, and it's very likely that the two met while Reginald was in Kamloops. After initial training in Canada on the 25th of October 1916, Reginald embarked at Halifax for England on the Cunard liner SS Mauritania, arriving there six days later. On 7th December, almost a year after enlisting, he arrived in France, joining the 16th Machine Gun Company, 54th Battalion, and he was in the field 16 days later. He would have been with the Canadian forces at the pivotal Battle of Vimy Ridge in April 17, where so many of his countrymen died. And this was followed by the much more protracted Passchendaele campaign from July to November 1917. It was here, towards the end of that battle, that Reginald was wounded. On 14th November, a shell exploded close to where he was, leaving him with a piece of shrapnel in his thigh. His wound was serious. Family tradition has it that he was pulled from where he fell by a man named Vickers. It may well have been Desmond Vickers, who was by that time a, a lieutenant and had been awarded the DSO for his part in the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Reginald spent a year recovering from his injury, first in France and then in various hospitals in England. On 28th March 1918, he was moved to Princess Patricia's Canadian Red Cross, Red Cross Hospital in Bexhill-on-Sea in Sussex. And it was here that he was tended by a nurse called Catherine Daisy Gillam. Nine months later, on the 26th of December 1918, they were married. But it was still to be eight more months before Reginald was recovered enough to be sent back to Canada. He was eventually discharged on 23rd August 1919, described as permanently unfit. Roy was born in 1922 and given the middle name Vickers after the man who dragged his father from danger at Passchendaele. Roy, his parents, and his two older sisters, Doris and Mildred, by 1931 were living in a four-room house in Okanagan Avenue, Penticton. Reginald's horticultural interest, remember he had a, a fruit orchard in his, in, his, in his yard, his horticultural interest flourished and he won prizes for his potatoes, carrots, parsnips, beets, and marrows. Roy, for his part, attended Penticton High School, where he complemented his studies with musical performances and recitals. 
at a commemoration of the anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, Roy presented a comic skit while his sister Mildred gave a solo vocal performance accompanied by Marion McQuiston of the same family as Bob Archer's wife. Roy <coughs> and his sister, excuse me, and his sister, Roy and his sister Mildred went on to present many performances at Christmas gatherings and other functions around Penticton. He also showed prowess as a boxer. In May 1942, so the Penticton Herald reported, he put on a nice display, winning his bout by a comfortable margin. At the same event, he took on an opponent in a bout of... <laughs> out of blindfolded barrel boxing. Now, this is not the man we're talking about, unfortunately, and they're not even blindfolded, but they do have barrels. And the purpose of this sport, if you can call it a sport, was that each contestant tried to box the other while having a large wooden barrel hanging from his shoulders, rather like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. The paper described it as a laughter getter, and it only ended when one of them fell over, because being blindfolded and stuck in the middle of a wooden barrel, it was impossible to stand up again. <laughs> Once he left school, Roy found temporary employment with the Penticton branch of the, Pen of the Provincial Forestry Department. And as he was a keen fisherman and hunter, he was also secretary of the Junior Fish, Game and Forest Protection Association. However, military matters also featured in the lives of the young Atkinsons. Roy joined the Sea Cadets. By 1942, age 20, he had risen to the rank of warrant officer. And it was in this capacity that he lowered the colours at the Gyro Park flagpole at the end of that year's Dominion Day commemoration. It was not long after this photograph was taken that Roy made his trip to Vernon to enlist in the army. Initially taken on as a private, he was soon identified as suitable for a tank regiment. And on 20th November, he was sent for initial military training. On 8th March 1943, Roy's pay was increased to the princely sum of $1.40 a day. And this enormous wealth, I think, must have gone to his head. Because the following day, he was admonished for being absent without leave and fined a day's pay at $1.40. Poor chap. Nevertheless, two days later, he emerged from basic training with the rank of trooper, which was a term for private in a cavalry regiment in which he now was. And he was posted to the advanced training center at Borden in Ontario. Camp Borden was at that time the most important training facility in Canada, serving both the Army and the Air Force. Canada had started to manufacture a tank known as the Valentine, in late 1939. There had been a few teething problems, but with Germany's invasion of France in May 1940, greater attention was given to the project. And Valentines were delivered to Camp Borden for training purposes. By 18th June 1943, Roy had learned to drive one and was given another pay rise, 25 cents a day. Whoa. This time he didn't blow it on leaving the camp without permission. He didn't need to. He was now ready to be transferred to Europe and was given two weeks special leave from 28th June to 11th July to bid farewell to his family in Penticton. Roy embarked for England on 20th July, arriving there eight days later. Further training ensued. In October 1943, he qualified as a tank gunner and in November, he also passed a wireless operator's course and was considered ready to face the enemy. The British Eighth Army had already begun its steady progress from the south of Italy, pressing the occupying Germans to retreat. And it was to aid the British that the Canadian Ninth Armoured Regiment was sent. Roy left England on the 14th of November and disembarked in Italy on the 27th. The Sherman Sherman, ah, thank you. The Sherman tank in which Roy was by now serving, although very useful in the streets of the towns and villages of Italy, was of little effect in the mountainous terrain of southern and central Italy. And the Germans were proving very difficult to dislodge. Progress was slow but steady, but not without the occasional reprieve for Roy. 
It was reported in the Herald in April 1944 that the Penticton Comforts Club had received a letter of thanks from Roy. And this Comforts Club organization sent cigarettes, chocolate, and tinned food as comforts to servicemen in the active theaters of war. However, in late July, his tank was set ablaze by a direct hit from a German shell during the protracted Melfa River campaign. Roy was lucky to escape with his life. And it was perhaps for this reason that he was able to take a short period of leave for rest and relaxation. A letter he wrote to a cousin was reproduced in the Penticton Herald on 3rd of August 1944 as Trooper Roy Atkinson writes of visit to Eternal City, which is the name given to Rome, the Eternal City. He spent a day in Rome visiting the sites, and being a soldier on leave from a war zone, he, in his words, consumed large quantities of liqueurs, champagne, vino, and high octane. I shudder to think. Dis descending in quality with his pocketbook, meaning the less money he had, the cheaper the things were, and therefore the less good they were, but he still carried on. Needless to say, he continued, my visit ended rather heavily. He went on, more recently, I've spent a fine, very enjoyable day at the beach, as perfect a time as I've had in a year. Swimming in the warm, salty Mediterranean, basking on a splendid beach, and in the beautiful moonlit nights, taking in a good movie from a most comfortable prone position on the warm sands. He concluded his letter with these words, Really, I'm beginning to think I'll soon become too lazy and useless for anyone's good. He died a few days later. Roy's remains were buried initially beside his burnt-out Sherman tank on a hillside near Pissarro Osteria di Nuova in eastern Italy's Marche region. They were later exhumed and reburied in the Gradara British Empire Cemetery about eight kilometers north. Among his few recovered possessions were two souvenir panoramas of Rome. After the war, Reg now I don't have a later picture of Reginald Atkinson, but I do have his signature, so that will have to do. After the war, Reginald Atkinson continued to be involved in military matters. He had already, in 1941, been appointed president of the Penticton branch of the Canadian Legion. In 1942, he became chairman of the local civilian recruiting committee. The following year, he was appointed commander of the Penticton District Pacific Coast Militia Rangers, a body that fulfilled a home guard or a sort of dad's army role for men who were not eligible for active service. In his legion capacity, Reginald was also responsible for the annual Armistice Day commemoration when, in 1944, he would have had to read out the name of his son as one of the fallen. In 1945, he was appointed rehabilitation officer for the Department of Veterans Affairs in Penticton. And as this was a full-time job, he was obliged to give up being a district fruit inspector, a role he had fulfilled for the previous 12 years, while he turned his attention to helping returned soldiers get their full pension entitlements. Busy as he no doubt was, Reginald Atkinson continued to add to his collection, collections of militaria, native artifacts, firearms, and antiques. And in 1954, the city gave him the use of the decommissioned stern wheeler SS Sycamus to house his collections. This splendid ship had been beached at the western end of Lakeshore Drive in 1951. And with Reginald Atkinson as the first curator, it became the Penticton Museum. Atkinson died on 10th November 1973 with the WS, uh, Reverend W.S. Beams once again officiating at his funeral, and he is buried also at Penticton's Lakeview ceremony. I would like to finish by reading to you a short poem from a little-known local poet. It's called Dulce et Decorum Est. Every year they come here in November, they stand in solemn silence and in awe, each one of them trying to remember what in heaven's name it was all for. 
Names are carved in stone or on a plaque, most of them so very, very young. None of them is ever coming back. They all deserve to have their praises sung. Many died in mud and blood and gore, machine gun bullets ravaging their chest. They cried out as their bodies hit the floor. Dulce et decorum est. Others flew in aircraft, large and small. They volunteered to go and do their best. In flames and screaming, from the sky they'd fall. Dulce et decorum est. Some of those we honor served at sea. They fought in frozen ships, their biggest test. They died ensuring you and I are free. Dulce et decorum est. They left in train loads heading off to war from this small town in Canada's far west. And we should not forget what it was for. Dulce et decorum est. Dulce et decorum est. Thank you.